Good glowing day, Adam's Blessed, to this week's sermon all about the superheroes of the Fallout series. If you ever wanted to know all about the superheroes, both popular and obscure, here we go through the lore, the real-world inspirations, and any interesting info about Fallout's mightiest heroes. The emphasis here is on superheroes, so radio play heroes like Herbert Daring Dashwood won't be mentioned here. So crank up the rads and pull out the mask and cape while we explore the interesting lore of Fallout's superheroes. The first time in the series that we can actually be a superhero, even though it's not for very long, is in Fallout 4 during the Silver Shroud quest, where we can act out our superhero fantasies being the hero of the same name. The Silver Shroud, like most of the superheroes in the Fallout series, is a creation of Hubris Comics, and the Shroud had his own radio plays, and there was a television series in the works as well, but that project was stopped cold by the onset of the Great War. The Silver Shroud was a popular hero, and as such was given a place among the Unstoppables, which was an alliance of Hubris Comics heroes that we will look at specifically a little later. The Shroud was particularly loved in Boston because that is where most of his adventures took place, and although he wasn't quite as popular in other markets, he was still the second most popular of all Hubris's heroes. The Silver Shroud's iconic look was a black fedora, a black trench coat, and either a silver or red scarf that he would let either blow in the wind for that extra wow factor or wear up over his nose and mouth. This noir style sets him apart from the rest of the superheroes, as does his primary weapon choice. The Shroud uses the vaunted Silver Submachine Gun, which has a unique look amongst all the submachine guns that can be found in Fallout 4, having a shinier and more silver colored receiver, barrel, and magazine, while the wood furniture is also a lot darker. The Silver Shroud is a self-made detective, or a private investigator that prowls the streets for injustice, where he stops those that he has deemed guilty of a crime, most often it would seem, with his special submachine gun. The Shroud is also adept at hand-to-hand -hand fighting, preferring to be sneaky, calculating, and work under the cover of night. He does have one trick up his sleeve though, and it isn't clear if this is some sort of superpower or the result of secret and advanced technology. The Shroud Silver Submachine Gun cannot hurt him, as seen, or really heard, in the Silver Shroud radio play Episode 6, where a supervillain known as the Mechanist attempts to kill the Silver Shroud using the Silver Submachine Gun. The bullets ricochet off of the Silver Shroud's coat right back at the Mechanist, killing him to the surprise of everyone except the Shroud, of course. He claims that the silver weapon can never harm him, but it's not clear how this is possible, so I'd like to hear your guesses. The Silver Shroud has a love interest as well, one of the other superheroes that is part of the Unstoppables, the Mistress of Mystery, whom he regularly teams up with on his adventures. She shows great interest in the Shroud, which is made most obvious in the radio plays that we get to hear in-game. We don't know too much else about his background other than he seems to come from a background with wealth because he has a butler, and in the TV series being produced, his butler, Jarvie Blake, was supposed to be given an English accent, as all good butlers should. Now my favorite part, where we look at the real world inspirations behind the character, and although I think the Silver Shroud is a blend of different inspirations, the primary inspiration is the comic hero, Dick Tracy. The Dick Tracy comic strip got its start in 1931 and continued for decades, expanding into a radio series, an animated television series, a live action TV series, several movies, and even a video game. Dick Tracy was a police detective who was most often portrayed in a fedora, trench coat, and tie, also often seen using a Tommy gun, just like our Fallout hero, except just substitute the tie for a scarf. Just look at this movie poster for the 1990 movie Dick Tracy and these Silver Shroud posters. It ticks all the boxes. They are also both detectives, although we aren't sure if the Silver Shroud 
is an official police detective, or maybe he's just a private eye. And neither of them have qualms with opening fire on the baddies, although the Silver Shroud is definitely more bloodthirsty. There also seems to be some inspiration from Batman, where he prefers to operate in the shadows and get the jump on people. He has his ironclad views on justice and being the bringer of said justice, and, you know, he has a butler. A major difference here, though, is that the Silver Shroud has zero problems when it comes to just gunning narrow duels down. And indeed, one of the Shroud's catchphrases is, Death has come for you, and I am its Shroud. One final interesting parallel with the Shroud is the Punisher Noir comic series that started in 2009 that sees an alternate Punisher in a trench coat, pulling no punches when it comes to meeting out his own brand of justice with hot lead. I would love to hear any other inspirations that you think may have influenced the Silver Shroud's character and design. We aren't quite done though, because as I mentioned before, we get the opportunity for the first time to act out being a superhero in game. In Fallout 4, the sole survivor will come across a friendly ghoul in the memory den, who is and has been obsessed with comic book heroes for centuries. Literally, Kent Connolly was an avid fan before the Great War and after his transformation, and all these years later, he still is a huge fan and is running a radio broadcast known as the Silver Shroud Radio, where he replays the Silver Shroud radio plays that have survived the Great War. He laments to the player that Good Neighbor is rife with crime and thugs taking advantage of vulnerable folks. Kent will talk about how the Silver Shroud wouldn't allow such things to happen, and thus, an idea is hatched. The Soul Survivor would don the garb and weapon of the Silver Shroud shortly after making a trip to the local Hubris Comics where they were shooting the upcoming Silver Shroud TV series. As a result, the Silver Shroud costume and a prop gun can be found there, along with a bunch of memorabilia like a signed photo and a script draft. Kent is grateful for the extra Shroud stuff and armors the Silver Shroud clothing and has already made an actual functioning weapon that looks just like the real silver submachine gun. He will start communicating to the Soul Survivor about individuals who need a reckoning with justice through his radio station. The player confronts several people with the option to speak to them in the voice and mannerisms of the famous deceptive detective. If you don't choose these speech options, then what are you even doing with your life? Because this whole quest is about being the Silver Shroud. After being sent after a murderer, a chem dealer, but not just any chem dealer, this guy's giving chems to kids, and an assassin, each time leaving them dead with a unique Silver Shroud calling card, Hancock, the mayor of Good Neighbor, will want to have a little chat. He will ask the Shroud to kill two more people who are notoriously violent and part of a gang run by a man known as Sinjin. After killing the second of Sinjin's goons, we'll learn that Sinjin and some of his raiders have gone to the memory den and kidnapped Kent Connolly, all in an attempt to lure the Shroud into their base where they can exact revenge. Killing all the way through the base results in a final confrontation where there are multiple options available to the player. Everything from begging for Kent to be released, to threatening Sinjin and his gang, to just killing Kent yourself the only right way, and yeah, I said it, I know it's Fallout, but come on, we're the Shroud, is to speak as the Shroud when confronting Sinjin and his gang. And after a little back and forth, Sinjin's gang members will lose their nerve and abandon their leader, leaving the Shroud to quickly try and deal with Sinjin before he can cap poor Kent. Saving Kent is officially the end of the quest, but not the end of the Shroud. Since Kent will bring the Silver Shroud radio back online three different times to let the Soul Survivor know that he can upgrade their Silver Shroud costume. At level 25, 35, and 45, Kent will extend his offer and each time the Shroud costume will get about 20 points of ballistic and energy resistance, which is on top of the bonuses the costume already provides, which is 15% more damage to humans and plus one to agility and perception. The Soul Survivor will get a few more opportunities, though, to roleplay as the Shroud in other parts of the game. At the end of the Automatron DLC, which has the player finding and confronting the Mechanist, a robot-obsessed character whose robotic creations are wreaking havoc across the Commonwealth, they will get a chance to speak as the Shroud only if they are wearing the Shroud costume. 
Additionally, in the Nuka World DLC, the player can speak to some of the robotic cowboys in the voice of the Shroud. And lastly, in a rather rare random encounter, the Shroud can speak to the man claiming to be another hubris comic hero, Manta Man. There will be many others that will make remarks if you wear the costume though, like the Watch Guards in Good Neighbor and Coulter the Overboss in Nuka World. And before we move on from the Silver Shroud, I wanted to point out a very interesting aspect of the Silver Shroud radio plays that we can hear in game. Listening to all six episodes makes it very clear that the Silver Shroud storyline parallels many important plot events in Fallout 4. In the radio play, the mayor of Boston, known as Mayor Murphy, is found to be a fake robotic replica of the real Mayor Murphy. Just like how Mayor McDonough of Diamond City is a synth replacement of the real McDonough, and they both have Irish names that start with M. The main enemy turns out to be none other than the Mechanist, one of the Shroud's major villains. The Mechanist commands an army of robots, similar to how the Institute has an army of synths, and everything the Mechanist does is an attempt to try and create a better life, a better commonwealth that was free from the petty squabbles of humankind. The Institute likewise is trying to transform both the commonwealth and mankind as a whole, and they see their pursuit as above the unimportant happenings of those that dwell in the commonwealth. Lastly, the heroes are able to get the better of the Mechanist from the help of a disaffected robot who felt unloved and discarded by its creator, the Mechanist. Similar to how a discarded synth was the key to helping the sole survivor break into the Institute, and that synth is good old Nick Valentine. The Mechanist is also found out at the end to be the real Mayor Murphy, which is a twist similar to the end of the Automatron DLC, where it is found out that the Mechanist is a woman who isn't actually trying to hurt anyone in the Commonwealth. It is interesting to see how much of the radio plays serve as foreshadowing for so many events, and there are some great details like how the robot Mayor Murphy that was murdered died in Scully Square, which is the part of Boston that Good Neighbor currently occupies. But before I conclude, I just wanted to show these two representations of the Silver Shroud from the Fallout Shelter online game. This one actually looks pretty good, and true to the artwork that we see in Fallout 4 and Fallout 76. The upgraded one though is... a little much. We went from Noir Vigilante of Justice to a Mafioso Rambo or something. I don't know, I'm just not feeling it. And with that, let's move on from the secretive and brutal Silver Shroud to... Manta Man. So where the Silver Shroud is said to be the second most popular Hubris Comics hero, Manta Man can be safely regarded as being dead last in the rankings. We'll look a bit closer at that in just a second, but Manta Man is seen on comic book covers and signs to be blonde, wearing a yellow or orange skin tight top, and green scaly tights. He has some kind of cape that attaches at his wrists, giving him what looks like wings or a, this is gonna sound crazy but hear me out, a manta ray shape. He appears to have blades affixed to his wrists that appear to be his primary weapons, and his special superpowers appear to be water related, as he is shown to be swimming and fighting underwater. Nowhere is this best seen than on the cover of an Unstoppables magazine where he is fighting kamikazes, who are suicidal communist dolphins that are trying to do whatever the hell communist dolphins do. He also teamed up with the Silver Shroud at one point to fight Mr. Abominable, an ancient caveman who thawed from the ice and went on a rampage. Manta Man is very obviously inspired by Aquaman, a DC comic hero whose first appearance was in More Fun Comics in 1941. Aquaman has a reputation as being kind of a meme, since his powers are often seen as underwhelming and too specialized since they are so water focused, and for this reason, Manta Man is more of a parody than anything else, seemingly having the same powers and a very similar costume, even down to the stylized M belt buckle. The reason I consider this more of a parody or lampoon of Aquaman is because the Fallout games make it known that Manta Man is a joke. In the Fallout 4 Hubris Comics location, there are some terminal entries that talk about the pre-orders that they had received for upcoming releases, and while Grognak had 102 pre-orders, Manta Man had two. 
This would happen again the next month when they were again given only two pre-orders and one of the workers at Huber's Comics begged their boss to stop buying and stocking the Manta Man comic books because they had too many and had to resort to giving them out for free. He is explicitly stated as having been included in the popular Unstoppables hero group because he was so unpopular and this was seen as a way to try and get him more popularity amongst fans. Lastly, in the sixth season of Fallout 76, which had a comic book theme, more specifically, a theme around the Unstoppables fighting against an alliance of villains called the Diabolicals. In the promo trailer produced for the season, a young girl who has been talking about each of the heroes abruptly stops at Manta Man and admits that she and no one else really knows what he can actually do. Manta Man does... Uh, I don't know, fish man stuff? <laughs> As mentioned when discussing the Silver Shroud, there is a random encounter in Fallout 4 where a man who can best be described as eccentric believes that he is Manta Man. This, uh, Manta Man looks absolutely nothing like the comic book character, but that does not deter him from roaming around the Commonwealth trying to bring justice to the lawless wastes. He can actually be found fighting three mole rats and he is armed with a junk jet, but, and this is critical, the junk jet cannot actually be used by NPCs because of the unusual way in which it works, taking ammo from the inventory. This means that he will usually die to these mole rats, unable to fight because of his choice of weapon. Although he may get lucky by finding a more powerful weapon nearby, or having his weapon knocked out of his hands and instead use his fists against the mole rats. Manta Man does not say a whole lot hailing the sole survivor but telling him that he doesn't have time to waste as crime waits for no man. If the player is dressed as the Shroud, he will greet the Silver Shroud saying that this is the first time the two heroes have been together since their last crossover episode. Still he won't join the player, rather run off to fight whatever hostels he can find and likely die as a result, but not before complaining to himself that the world experienced a tragedy since the Great War prevented the Man to Man series from revealing that he had an evil twin brother. I think this is a great representation of Man to Man in the post-war world, a simple and deluded man armed with a useless weapon who most often dies to one of the weakest of all wasteland creatures. But I will say the Fallout Shelter online illustrations actually make him look pretty cool. Now to another member of the Unstoppables group that we actually know the least about. The Inspector is a woman who is dressed in circus regalia and a top hat and is often seen with a large magnifying glass. She is mentioned in Fallout 3 and shown on the Unstoppables covers in Fallout 4 and 76, but we have to rely on less authoritative sources to understand even a little bit about her. A Creation Club Pip-Boy skin that is themed after her mentions that she is a magician detective who looks for clues and can cast spells. One of the covers of the Unstoppables seem to show her doing some sort of magic, and of course her magnifying glass features prominently often as well. She is described as the most mysterious member of the Alliance, and really, that's all we know about her. That is indeed mysterious. She seems to be inspired by a DC hero known as Zatanna, a woman of a race of humans who are unique in that they have magical abilities. She uses this to her advantage, being a magician and illusionist by trade, but she also uses her powers to try and make the world a better place. She was first featured in Hawkman in 1964, and since has been seen several times, including a stint as a member of the vaunted Justice League. She wears a performer's outfit, and most notably has a large top hat. The Inspector is similar in almost every way, except that we know that she is a detective on top of looking like a circus ringleader and performing magic quite like Zatanna. Captain Cosmos was an incredibly popular comic book hero whose franchise had expanded into radio and television series as well, known as the Adventures of Captain Cosmos. First being revealed in Fallout 3, Captain Cosmos flies through space having numerous adventures with his monkey sidekick called Jangles the Moon Monkey, as well as his second in command and weapon specialist known as Stella Skyfire. Captain Cosmos is seen in a spacesuit with a futuristic ray gun and is also said to use a rocket pack to help him get around. 
His popularity is clearly evident as it is said that Captain Cosmo's costumes were the most sought after in the lead up to Halloween and there was a lot of cross promotion as well since sugar bomb advertisements talk about a free prize. With each box of sugar bombs, the buyer would find a secret Captain Cosmos decoder ring, an homage to times when such toys and trinkets could be found inside cereal boxes. Fallout 76 lets us hear an advertisement for sugar bombs and this decoder ring on the pirate radio station. Captain Cosmos and Stella Skyfire tell listeners that in order to read the specially hidden messages on a new board game called The Legendary Run, they would first need to get the decoder rings from a box of nutritious sugar bombs. So this game, The Legendary Run, was part of the first season in Fallout 76, where completing challenges would advance the player's Captain Cosmos piece across a board game, while one of Captain Cosmos' villains gave chase. This villain, Dr. Zorbo, would make an appearance in a later season, but I am saving details on him for an upcoming video on the supervillains of Fallout. Captain Cosmos is certainly inspired by popular sci-fi adventure heroes like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, which became popular comic strips in the early 20th century and would go on to spawn numerous radio and TV series, as well as movie adaptations throughout the years. Buck Rogers was a pop culture sensation and is credited for popularizing the concept of space exploration by showing him blast off into space on rockets and encountering and often fighting with aliens. Similar to how Captain Cosmos has a sidekick and a close female second in command, Buck Rogers had a robot sidekick named Tweaky and he worked very closely with a high ranking officer and starfighter pilot named Colonel Wilma. There are a number of interesting things about Captain Cosmos in the Fallout series including the crossover TV episode where he and the Silver Shroud met each other. We also know a number of comic book titles like Captain Cosmos vs. The Moon Men and Truth, Justice, and the Space American Way, just to name a few. That last title is a reference to a famous line by Superman who is known to mention Truth, Justice, and the American Way. Jingles the Moon Monkey has a doll that can be first encountered in Fallout 4 and Fallout 76, and it's worth mentioning that this cute little monkey that we see in Fallout 3 promotional material with a long exposed tail sticking out of his spacesuit looks crazed and utterly terrifying in doll form. The doll doesn't have the long exposed tail and instead has a chimp-like face with crazed red eyes and exposed teeth. Space has not been kind to this poor monkey. There is a Captain Cosmos holotape that is called Jangle's Big Day that was meant to be in Fallout 4 but was cut. The holotape game itself is not even accessible via console commands, so this is just a cut reference. In Fallout 76 though, we see the Robco Fun magazine that was supposed to come with the game, but again, there is no such holotape found. There is one official piece of Creation Club content that is centered on Captain Cosmos and has to do with a project to create a Captain Cosmos TV series. The quest has the sole survivor travel to the Hub 360 building where the filming studio could be found in order to recover items that were used in the filming. The US Space Administration had loaned some items to the production crew for filming which the player can claim for themselves after dealing with the Ghoulified production crew. The main prize is the CC-00 power armor that definitely looks like it was made for space exploration. The second to last of the Unstoppables members on this list is the one and only Mistress of Mystery. From what we learned about the Shroud, we know that she regularly has crossovers with him. And yeah, that's a euphemism. She also teamed up with the Inspector in some mystery serials called Mysterium and is the only other hero we know of to do so. She is one of the longest running heroes owned by Hubris Comics and has since been in hundreds of comic books, radio broadcasts, a weekly newspaper strip, five novels, and many lines of action figures. She was also meant to feature in the Silver Shroud TV serial series that was kept from being produced and released by the fury of nuclear annihilation. There was some serious dispute behind the scenes of the TV show, where some producers wanted to use a younger, different actress to represent the mistress because the long-standing voice actor for the mistress of mystery was seen as a little too old not fresh and popular like the new up-and-coming tv stars this was an issue for a lot of reasons shannon rivers who was the long-standing voice of the mistress had an iconic voice and dark hair 
in contrast with Claire Riddell, who was supposed to replace her, who was blonde, with a voice that was described as squeaky. The Mistress of Mystery has an elegant costume, for lack of a better word, seems to be largely from the early 20th century, and she has large, prominent jewelry as well, but some of these are much more functional than you would think. She recently had a costume change where her traditional long dress was being changed for a much shorter one, upsetting some fans. One such fan was Kent Connolly, the ghoul from the Silver Shroud quest, who wrote a letter expressing his distaste at the change before the Great War ghoulified him. The mistress herself does not seem to have any superpowers. Rather, she is an excellent fighter, both with firearms, blades, and hand-to-hand -hand combat, with an emphasis on kicking. And these innate talents are enhanced by objects that seem to be a blend of technology and magic. She is described as not being a sniper or one to jump into the fray, rather relying on being calculating and using her diverse weapons and gear. All of her weapons and some of her jewelry are named after Egyptian gods, giving her an ancient and mystical dimension to her character as well. We get to learn of her name and tragic backstory, both things that we can only speculate on for many other heroes. She was known as Claudia Martin before taking up her persona and was the daughter of two American archaeologists that suddenly vanished while doing some work investigating the lost pyramid of Amun-Ra. She was left with no one and nothing forced to learn how to survive on the streets of Cairo alone for a time until she had a stroke of luck. She was adopted by a wealthy heiress and therefore afforded a life outside of the poverty and uncertainty on the streets. She would eventually come to inherit her parents' remaining possessions, which sent her on a journey to discover what had happened to them and led her on adventures with ancient Egyptian legends and secret groups. When considering the inspiration for The Mistress of Mystery, there didn't seem to be any satisfactory comic inspirations, but she does have some parallels with Laura Croft from the Tomb Raider series. They both benefited from a wealthy background, although The Mistress came into wealth at a much later age than Laura Croft, who grew up with wealth her whole life. Laura would take an interest in adventures with a particular eye for ancient artifacts and mysteries, and many times found herself in far-flung parts of the world, often in a race to recover powerful, valuable, and often magical ancient artifacts before malevolent groups could. These adventures took her to Egypt, especially in the early games, where there's a whole storyline of how she released a vengeful Egyptian god, Set, who she had to stop. Laura also has a proclivity for dual-wielding pistols, but has been shown to be adept at many other kinds of weapons, and is very athletic, letting her evade the traps and creatures that would kill someone less skilled. The Mistress likewise has a preference for her pistol, named after the god of Set, and these weapons and items seem to be objects that she has claimed for herself during her adventures, although that's not explicitly stated, and she prefers to go on her Indiana Jones or Tomb Raider-like adventures, all by herself. The Mistress of Mystery is a very interesting character because not only was she this fictional person that one could read about or listen to on the radio, but after the Great War, she damn near became a real life superhero. In Fallout 76, we can happen upon a manor owned by a wealthy family and investigating a bit deeper, we come to find out that it was owned by the actress Shannon Rivers, the voice of the Mistress radio serials. She and her husband, Frederick, along with their daughter, Olivia, would survive the Great War and go on to attempt to bring order and justice to a chaotic and cruel post-war world. Frederick had paid for basically an entire secret base below their mansion to help his wife train for her role on TV, and she had learned to fight from some of the best teachers in the world. All of this would be massively beneficial in the post-war years, as Shannon was able to defend herself and her family from raiders and would go on to teach her daughter the ways of the mistress. This effort expanded to other girls as well, as the need for protection, particularly of the young and vulnerable, became Shannon's calling. This led to her creating a group she called the Order of Mysteries to train and care for young girls who themselves could go on to help others after being under her tutelage. The Order's ultimate goal was to protect the people of Appalachia to any threat of their lives or liberty through courage, cunning, and compassion, the three most exemplary traits of the Mistress of Mystery. A whole video could and should be devoted to this Order, but suffice it to say that they were remarkably efficient and ruthless when dealing with the numerous raider groups 
that sprang up from the ashes of the old world. And that is until Shannon's own daughter betrayed the Order, which led everyone down a path of destruction. The Order of Mysteries would be defunct sometime in the late 2080s as the real-life Mistress of Mysteries was killed. The real-life Mistress had a number of objects inspired by the comic hero to help her fight the murderous raider groups. The Veil of Secrets was a veil meant to conceal identity as well as protect against gas, smoke, and fumes. Somehow hones the senses, and in game it can protect against airborne diseases, dangers, and opens the secret entrance to her base. The Garb of Mysteries is the dress that the mistress wears and increases perception by one and makes sneaking 5% more effective while providing damage resistance on par with some lower level armors. The Phantom Device is a modified stealth boy that will make the user go invisible, but also deploy canisters of hallucinogen gas that will frenzy nearby enemies for some time. The Blade of Bastet is a legendary sword that will ignore 50% of target's armor, and in the Mistress lore is said to be handed down through the ages and capable of piercing any armor or barrier. The Voice of Set is a pistol that I recently covered, a 44 revolver that is her primary weapon that does extra damage to robots. In the lore, it was able to fire bullets that explode into smoke, disable or disrupt both electronics and magic. The real life mistress even admits that the pistol does whatever the writers needed it to do, so the limits of its powers are unknown. Lastly, a jewelry piece called the Eye of Ra that in the comics was her greatest relic that let her draw upon the extent of her abilities. As such, the brooch will increase the effects of all other clothing and weapons associated with the mistress. It gives greater damage resistance and sneak to the garb of mysteries, increases the effective time of the phantom device, increases damage against robots for the voice of Set, and gives the Blade of Bastet 100% armor penetration. And so the story of the Mistress of Mysteries reaches a conclusion, but this will certainly not be the last we see of her. Now it is time for the most popular superhero of all, the brutal, the stunningly toned, Grognak the Barbarian. Oh yes, Grognak is the hero that we know the most about, and much of this is because he got an early start, first appearing in Fallout 3. There was a very robust comic series featuring Grognak, and we know he also had at least two video games that were centered on him and his adventures as well. One text-based adventure game, and another CRPG in the style of Ultima, or the original Wasteland. We also know of an official Grognak Child's Club called Grognak's Little Heathens, that were being asked to give feedback on the text-based adventure game. Grognak is a blonde buff warrior who is sometimes not even blonde, like in the Fallout 3 comics. He's also always seen without a shirt, and a green or brown loincloth with brown boots, and wields either a sword or his iconic battle axe. Grognak is a not-so-subtle reference to Conan the Barbarian, a well-known fictional hero that was first conceived in the early 1930s when he featured in pulp magazines, later expanding to comics, books, the big screen, the small screen, and video games. He truly covers the entire spectrum. Although Conan was portrayed in a number of ways in his early days, by the time that Marvel started publishing Conan the Barbarian comics in 1970, by issue number 12, the magazine covers were very similar to the covers for the Grognak comic books. Just look at the font and style of Grognak at the top, and the sword with the Barbarian printed on it. On every cover, Conan is shown prominently fighting some fierce enemy heroically, very often with a scantily clad or mostly naked and helpless woman nearby, which is also extremely common with the Grognak comics. So the best thing about Grognak, as I mentioned before, is that we actually get to see many of his different comics. In Fallout 3, Grognak the Barbarian comic books are consumable items that will permanently raise the Lone Wanderer's melee weapon skill by one or two with the Comprehension perk. With 25 possible magazines found throughout the Capital Wasteland, the magazines can represent a substantial addition to the player's melee skill. All of the Fallout 3 Grognak comics have the same cover, with Grognak fighting some sort of winged serpent with a helpless, half-naked dame cowering on the ground. This addition is called in the Lair of the Virgin Eater, 
and doesn't seem to have any sort of inspiration, although there is a Conan comic that features a feathered serpent, which is issue number 64. Fallout 4 has 10 Grognak comics that can be found, but what makes them so cool this time is that each one has a unique cover, and they each give the Soul Survivor plus one to the Barbarian perk. Barbarian is a hidden perk that is only increased by the magazines, and with each issue of Grognak that is found, the player's critical damage is increased by 5%. So with all 10 magazines, critical hits can cause an additional 50% more damage. These magazine covers are fabulous though, and many of them have easter eggs or references to Conan the Barbarian. The issue, Blood on the Harp, may be a reference to a novel by David Winston that is a story that takes place in medieval Ireland of the same name. The issue, Cometh the Trickster, is a reference to the Thief games, and the Trickster is the main antagonist of Thief the Dark Project. He is portrayed in the Thief games as a satyr, or he's satyr-like, and so is the Trickster on the cover of Grognak. I didn't find anything that the Jungle of the Bat Babies could be referencing, but the issue in the bosom of the Corsair Queen could be alluding to a Conan story called The Queen of the Black Coast, where Conan and the Queen of the Pirates named Balit meet after Conan's ship is raided. The two fall in love when Conan shows his fighting prowess, and they go on to raid and do pirate things together, I'm sure. Although the story ends with Belit dying, this story seems like it would be similar to the story in Grognak. There's also a comic book character called the Corsair Queen that was published in the 1950s by Quality Comics that this could be referencing. Demon Slaves, Demon Sands shows Grognak struggling with a djinn-like creature, and the name may be referencing the third major update to Dungeons & Dragons Online or DDO, which is an MMORPG that started in 2006. The issue called Enter Mala, War Maiden of Mars, could be referencing a 1950s comic called Planet Stories that featured an issue that had a story about a warrior made of Mars. The issue Fatherless Kerr didn't seem to reference anything I could find, although Conan the Barbarian does fight a number of dog and wolf-like enemies. But Lost in the Snows of Lust seems to be a reimagining of an early Conan the Barbarian story called The Gods of the North that was released well before the Conan comics in 1934. The last issue, called What Sorcery Is This?, seems somewhat similar to the cover of The Wizard and the Warrior, which was issue number 29. The title seems to be a reference to a common expression, but the wizard-like figure in the issue is actually a reoccurring villain in the universe of Grognak. There are a number of mentioned only issues as well, like the Ants of Agony, which features the infamous antagonizer villain that we'll be looking at in another video. Another issue called Heavy the Oaken Crown, seems like it might be a Lord of the Rings reference, and one called Revenge of the Mansaurian, which I can only guess involved a half man, half lizard thing. One issue is called Grognak's Salute to the Troops, which sounds like a propaganda issue, and finally one called An Axe for All Ages. While none of the games let us live out a life as a superhero as well as Fallout 4 with the Silver Shroud quest, we can get Grognak's clothing and axe if we wanted to roleplay ourselves. Grognak's axe can be found inside Hubris Comics in a display case in Fallout 4, and although it cannot be modified at all, that is hardly necessary because it has the bleeding legendary effect which does damage over time, it causes enemies to stagger more often when hit, and has a hidden effect where it uses less AP when used in vats. Also located in Hubris Comics is Grognak's costume, which consists of gloves, a loincloth, and boots, and in the case of a female character, a brown top. Hey, I've seen enough comic book covers to know that that is not very Grognak. The clothing increases melee damage by 25% and increases strength by 2, while also allowing for shoulder armor to be worn, although chest armor isn't allowed because Grognak's power is directly proportional to how many abdominal muscles are visible. It has next to zero damage resistance, but Grognak doesn't even know what the word defense even means, so that totally tracks. I also love how absurdly thin the costume is. It's like wearing a tissue loincloth. Even better though, you can see the characters whitey tighties when wearing the fight. In Fallout 76, the costumes are available in the Atom Shop, one that looks just like the one in Fallout 4, and the other called the King Grognak Costume, 
alluding to a story where Grognak becomes a king. You can even get a wax statue as a decor item for your camp in case dressing like him is not enough. Grognak's nemesis appears to be a necromancer named Greylock that is seen on one of the covers and the main antagonist of the two known video games, The Reign of Greylock and Grognak and the Ruby Ruins. The Reign of Greylock is the text adventure that can be played in Fallout 3 and is only available on one terminal in the Hubris Comics location. And I will go into more detail in an upcoming video, but Grognak goes on an adventure to obtain a magical sword that will allow him to confront Greylock and kill him by throwing his magical sword into Greylock's mouth, after which it will cause him to explode, sending thick green blood everywhere. The complete text-based nature of this game is very reminiscent of games like Planetfall and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Grognak and the Ruby Ruins is a Pip-Boy game that can be found in Fallout 4, bundled with a Rob Co. Fun magazine found in the Memory Den. It can be played on the Pip-Boy, or any terminal, and rather than being text-based, it is a turn-based game with images similar to the Bard's Tale. Once again, Grognak is sent to defeat Greylock, although this time they can have companions. And we can clearly see for the image of Greylock that he is the same figure on the cover of What Sorcery Is This? The Grognak comics have been an enduring part of Bethesda's Fallout games, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Speaking of things that can't be stopped, we have gone over every superhero that is a member of the Unstoppables, which is an alliance of several hubris comics heroes similar to DC's Justice League or Marvel's Avengers. They have their own comics that can be found in Fallout 4 and 76, with both games having the same exact magazines. Finding and reading a copy of the Unstoppables gives the player a 1% increase to a hidden perk called Unstoppable, and that percentage corresponds to the chance the player has of avoiding all damage from any given attack. With five possible issues, that makes a maximum of 5%. In Fallout 76, they operate in a similar manner, although the magazines will provide a percentage chance of avoiding various kinds of damage, like explosive damage or critical damage, they wear off after 30 minutes. These covers are great, like the one featuring Manta Man that we talked about earlier, where he's fighting off kamikazes, which are cyborg dolphins with built-in explosives. I believe this is a reference to military dolphins that were trained by the Soviet Union, and there were many things that they could do, including seeking out non-Russian vessels that when they got close to the ship, a naval mine that was attached to their body would detonate. Literal communist kamikaze dolphins. I would take this story with a grain of salt though, but it could definitely be the inspiration behind the comic. The issue called Who Can Stop the Unstoppable Gragnarok? is an issue where Grognak falls under the control of some evil spirit or influence that turns him against his superhero friends. This Ragnarok seems to be a reference to the villain of the same name that is featured in Marvel's Thor comics. The issue, trapped in the dimension of the terror dactyls, is a fun pun, and the only reference to such things I could find were in two episodes of He-Man, where they are attacked by terror dactyls, although they don't really look alike. The issue called Visit the Uxron Galaxy is unlike any other, showing the heroes among a horde of alien beings, apparently in a totally different galaxy. I came up short trying to find any sort of relation to real life pop culture, so if you have an idea, let me know. The last issue features the Unstoppables, who must fight Dr. Brainwash and his army of robotic minions called Decapitalists. This propaganda piece shows the main villain, Dr. Brainwash, who looks similar to the Batman villain, The Thinker, what with those brain-enhancing protrusions jutting off their heads. There was a board game made for the Unstoppables that we get to see and learn a bit about in Fallout 76 called The Unstoppable Shindig. This apparently quite popular game had each of the Unstoppables as a playable character. The player would spin a spinner and it would open a corresponding door which would have a surprise villain behind it for the player to encounter. The way it is explained makes it sound incredibly similar to the 1960s board game Mystery Date, which had a similar premise, except it involved finding a desirable date, rather than a supervillain, although that could be a pretty interesting date. Now we have a number of lesser known heroes, but they are nonetheless quite interesting. The Creation Club in Fallout 4 introduced a quest called Speak of the Devil, which revolved around an ex-Enclave member from the Capital Wasteland who came to dub himself the Black Devil. 
After leaving a special enclave unit called the Devil's Hand, he made his way up to the Commonwealth, being disaffected by the enclave and their actions. He adopted the moniker the Black Devil after coming across a pre-war hubris comics book that showed an anti-communist hero known as the Black Devil. This was made even more appropriate because he was wearing a suit of horned devil power armor that the Capital Wasteland Enclave used extensively that had never been seen in Fallout 4. The player is rewarded the armor after completing the small quest and we get a glimpse of what this Black Devil hero looks like. Wielding a trident and sporting horns on the head and a long tail, the Black Devil would work with the US government to fight communists. He somehow merged his body with the constitution and his body was covered with the document's ink, which is probably why he's called the Black Devil. He loves patriotic music, in particular the Battle Hymn of the Republic, the Stars and Stripes Forever, and America the Beautiful, which apparently one just needs to play in order to summon the Black Devil. He seems inspired by DC's Blue Devil, which is a hero that was created when a demon fused the character, Daniel Cassidy, with his robotic demon costume that he was wearing for a movie. The two devils seem to share a similar origin in that they melded with an existing object to become their superhero persona. As just a little extra tidbit, in Fallout 2, the companion Cassidy will mention to the Chosen One that he received his name from some old pre-war superhero. And maybe, just maybe, Daniel Cassidy, who was the Blue Devil, is the hero he was named after. K.D. Inkwell is a time-traveling hero from the Astounding Awesome Tales magazine in the Atomic Chronicles of K.D. Inkwell, where she is a historian for a group called the Guild of Antiquities. She and other members of this group use special devices called chronotrons to travel to different points in time to help the group in cataloging, and in some instances collecting, items of historical interest. This sends her on missions throughout time where she gets aid from people like Alistair the Knight of Avalon, or fighting against bizarre foes like the Mind Collective, which are a group of human-dolphin hybrids who want nothing more than to capture Inkwell and assimilate her. She wears garb similar to early 20th century adventurers with the Chronotron mounted on her back and she uses a large fountain pen called the Atomic Quill that is strapped to her forearm, although it's not entirely clear how it's used. She featured in The Scribe of Avalon, an escape from the 42nd century board games, which were the third and fifth seasons respectively for Fallout 76. In Fallout New Vegas, we get a glimpse of a superhero known as La Fantoma in the magazine of the same name. The magazines are all in Spanish, and it's unclear if this was a localized hero or was more widespread outside of Spanish-speaking markets. The Spanish on the front refers to La Fantoma as stalking the night, and the magazine will increase the player's sneak for 60 seconds. So it's obvious this hero is an expert in stealth. The cover is actually a recolored and rotated version of Adventure Comics 428, which is the origin issue of a hero called Black Orchid who herself is particularly adept at disguising herself, and so there seems to be some connection between her and La Fantoma. There are 18 issues of the magazine with all DLCs installed, and it can even be crafted for the player. There is a mention-only group known as Hell's Chain Gang, and all we know about them is that they were a group of Vigilant Vigilantes, which is a useless yet funny description, and this group was to team up with none other than the fan favorite Vault Boy. Yes, Vault Boy was to be a comic hero because Vault Tech can't leave well enough alone and have to get their filthy mitts over every corner of America. They were supposed to fight together against a communist invasion that had just occurred, sounding like some sort of freedom fighters, reminiscent of Red Dawn or something similar. But unfortunately, that's all we know. And that, my magnamious friends, are the superheroes of Fallout. As always, I love to hear from you and any additional comments you have for this conversation. Thank you for watching the whole video, and a huge thank you to my patrons and YouTube members as well. A special welcome to the newest members of Adam's Devoted, Dalton Aleph Terrace, Colby Stanek, and Dark Sajik. Your faith will be rewarded. As always, you can build Adam's kingdom in any way you would like. Embrace the glow, brothers and sisters. Be kind to yourself and others, 
you are comprised of trillions of worlds after all. I will see you soon.